Hello, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for this very special workshop around education as part of developing the second version of the Robotics Roadmap for Australia. My name is Sue Kay and I'm the Chair of Robotics Australia Group and uh, was one of the principal architects of putting the first version of Australia's uh, Robotics Roadmap together. First, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the very different lands on which we are all meeting today and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So the Robotics Roadmap for Australia, the first edition was released in mid 2018. And that was at a time when I was working for a group called the Australian Centre for Robotic Vision which was funded by the Australian government to bring robotics and computer vision together. And the reason for putting the roadmap together was because we recognised that uh, we had a lot of great things happening in robotics in Australia, but that it was quite fragmented and our industry is quite immature. And the roadmap was an attempt to try and map out a lot of the capability that exists here in Australia. Now, in putting the second version of the roadmap together, um, we got quite a lot of feedback that people really would like to see more of an emphasis, not just on skills and training, but how robots are used in education. And um, not only how robots are used in education, but how education potentially uh, can be um, uh, applied, uh, preparing people with an education that will allow them to adapt to a lot of the technological changes that we're anticipating we will see in the future. And that was actually one of the recommendations from the first version of the robotics roadmap. So um, we actually had quite a long list of recommendations. So this is just sort of boiling it down into a summary form. And I guess the recommendation that is most relevant to, the day, to today's workshop was the one around education and equipping all Australians with industry for relevant skills. And we need to do that across all age ranges because the pace of technological change keeps increasing. And the more that people understand technology, the less likely they are to fear technology. And also the more likely they are to be able to take advantage of that and hopefully have long and um, very fulfilling careers. So as I mentioned today, the subject that we're going to be talking about is how we can apply robotics in education and also how education can uh, adapt uh, and help to prepare people for a future where robots are going to become a lot more common. And just to give you a bit more background, the reason that we have decided to do a second version of the roadmap is really to try and keep the momentum going from the first version of the roadmap. Until we had done the first version of the roadmap, it really was not very clear what the capability of um, robotics in Australia really was. And so it, that was really our first attempt to actually define how many companies are operating in the space and the, the types of work that they're doing and which sectors across the Australian economy it's being applied to. One of the important things that we want to do in the second version of the roadmap is to really try and encourage the right skills development. And uh, that's where this workshop is very important. It's also important that we identify where Australia can make a difference because we're a small nation, we can't boil the ocean, but there are some areas where Australia has clear strengths in robotics. We also want to use the, the, um, this process to keep unearthing capability. And so we invite you, if you have good case studies and examples of how robotics is being applied in education or educational programs that are preparing people for a career in robotics, uh, we really encourage you to share those with us. And our ultimate goal is to establish a really clearly recognised robotics industry in Australia so that we're not just users of robotics technology, but that we are also producers of these robotics technologies. And because we have had to move to a virtual format for these workshops, we appreciate that that makes it a bit harder for people to contribute. And so you'll find on our website and also um, you'll see on the screen at the moment, a link to a survey that you can fill in at any time to give us your view on uh, where you think the roadmap should be heading and where you think robotics in Australia can head. 
So our agenda for today, uh, first we're going to go uh, in age order in terms of uh, looking first at primary education with Simon Code from Trinity College in South Australia, then looking at secondary education with Greg Tardiani from the New South Wales Department of Education. We're going to then have a look at the vet education sector with Gail Bray from Wyndham Tech Schools and then finish off by looking at higher education with Damien Keane, our ed tech consultant. Uh, we'll then have some Q&A and we will uh, close at four o'clock. So I'm going to hand you over first uh, to Simon. Um, our, but first, I'd like to thank my co-chess, Damien Key. Sorry, Keen. I must have been keen when I was putting that previous slide together. Um, Damien Key, Gail Bray, Simon Code, uh, Greg Tardiani and Nikki Russo. Uh, I encourage you to fill out the survey. Uh, but next, we are going to hear from Simon Code uh, uh, on primary education and what's happening with robotics in primary education. Thanks very much, Simon. Okay, um, <clears throat> thank you, Sue. I'll just share what we've got there. Okay, um, well, from a primary perspective, and I guess for myself working in, in a system, I work in a sort of early years to year 10 area, but mainly focusing in the primary school division. So when we look at that, um, we're saying from here, you know, Primary education we know is the, the first stage of formal education. So when children obviously come out of their kindergartens, they step into this atmosphere. So we generally look between the ages of five and 12. And of course that can differ between states. I mean, here in South Australia, we still regard year seven as primary school, but in a lot of other states and territories that has changed, we'll be changing that very soon. So, you know, and, and what we have obviously for us is unique because a lot of the time, as in my case, we are pretty much responsible for teaching everything most of the time. So we're not specialized in what you would find in secondary. So, you know, for us, and sometimes when it comes to technologies, it says there, um, sometimes we will have teachers that are specific in that, like I get the opportunity here, but it's not always the case. So in there, we effectively in the primary school, we use it from two different capacities. So, you know, generally in the curriculum, like we would do across the whole thing, or as a co-curricular. So generally in the curriculum, we would use it. I mean, the general capability used to be information communication technology. So a lot of the times you just have students, you know, doing things like PowerPoints and using Word and knowing how to do that. But obviously as it's gone through, we still implement that a little bit more with robotics. But then as also as co-curriculars, we allow, you know, kids to specialize. So whether it is RoboCup Junior, FLL, et cetera, like that. So plus we also have coding clubs that are now becoming pretty big. So I guess also for us with primary education, our aim really is to prepare the students for, you know, as they go beyond. So for us, you know, we just really want to prepare them up for secondary. So we want them to not only understand when we look at robotics, we not only just want them to play with the toys, but it's mainly a purpose of design thinking process. So we want the students by the end of this, when they move to secondary, to be able to think critically, be innovative and adapt because the technology is just changing all the time. And most of the time we find that students are way ahead of teachers and the teacher's job is normally to try to keep ahead of the game. Um, but you know, for us, it's it's enabling them just to have that confidence to be able to actually have this piece of technology in them and not just use it as a robot per se, but also to use it across multiple classes for, for various lessons. So, you know, for more we can do that, we're actually helping secondary. So rather than when children move to secondary school, they're, you know, having to all start again. If we can allow them to have a really good base of what they need to do and how to do things, it means that in secondary school, when they step out of there, they're a lot more confident and able to expand themselves even further with the technology. Um, with a case study, what we'll be looking from there, that's at my school. So at Trinity College, we're one of the, regarded as the, the biggest college in the Southern Hemisphere. I think we've just, actually we've been put down to number two right now. But um, so for us, we're an Anglican school up in the, the northern suburbs of Adelaide. So I say we have 
we're kind of unique where we actually have five different schools. So we are split into kind of four little schools, reception to 10, and then um, 11 and 12 are senior. So we have lots of different robotic programs that we do. I mean, part of my role now is to collect and work with all of the campuses to, to gain confidence with the teachers and, and that's coaching them through and what they need. So for us in, in briefly, um, you know, here, part of my role uh, last year was to, to map out the curriculum. So we used through ACARA and the Digital Technologies Hub to pretty much look at a whole school approach where we work with students from early years and work with the teachers. So um, all the way through to year six, and then they go further um, beyond. So what we're looking from there is that you know, we wanted each year level, well, I wanted each year level to basically be able to play with a device. So in the first half of the year, we work with the students through various coding programs um, to allow them to think what's happening, you know, use mathematical skills, use communication skills um, in English, which is very important, chuck in a few bit of science as well. So that becomes across the co-curricular, sorry, the cross-curricular area. And then from there, um, as they go through from early years all the way through to, you know, year three, year four, year five, they are encountering different devices with very, very similar coding. So the kind of scratch um, Blockly programming. So that allows them to extend themselves and, and go beyond. And it's been amazing to see, you know, it's been quite effective at the moment to see year ones being able to confidently grab a micro bit and being able to program it and tell you not only how it works, but you know, where there's a problem, if they're suddenly putting in the wrong piece of code and being able to communicate and, and work together. So, you know, that's where we're looking from here, but ultimately in, in primary school, it's, you know, whether it is using the technology in the classroom, but in, in co-curricular through various programs allow them to expand such as RoboCup, which we do a lot here in, um, at our school to prepare those kids that really want to push themselves to go into various competitions. So with the robotics equipment, you know, it's, it's allowing those kids to have the experience. Hands-on play in education is really important, whether it's hands-on in maths, whether it's hands-on in science, you know, kids learn best when they have equipment in their hands and, you know, by doing the hard work at the start um, to allow them to do that, that's ultimately where we're really going from. And I guess that would be it for now. I'll hand it back to you, Sue. Thanks very much, Simon. Um, and uh, yeah, gee, I could do with a couple of those year ones around at my place. <laughs> That would be really handy. Uh, it's very impressive um, to see what they can do at such a young age. Thank you. Um, next, I'll invite Greg Tardiani to talk to us about what's happening in secondary education. Thanks, Greg. Okay, I'll share my screen now. And five. Um, okay, so Greg Tardiani, I'm from the New South Wales Department of Education, tied in with the um, Information Technology Directorate. Uh, I've taught in schools for over 40 years. I am a retired teacher, but they've decided to call me back into what we loosely call head office. And um, I get to play with toys basically all day long, which is a stack of fun. And while somebody's still willing to keep paying me to do things like playing with toys, I'm having a ball doing it. Uh, I've been a little bit cheeky by putting secondary K-12 because my current role goes right through from K to 12. Um, I will concentrate on the secondary side of things and give you a little bit of insight into that. But as even Simon alluded to, primary is preparing them for secondary. Um, and so the, a lot of the stuff that I'm involved with is related to that. Uh, our learners are basically age 12 to 19. So we do get some young ones and then we do get some uh, kids that go through and they don't all leave at 18. Some of them are 19 uh, when they're in year 12. Um, the process that we're doing in New South Wales is the idea of trying to get uh, robotics and I will sort of tie in technology um, across all subject areas. We really try to, uh, and being a TAS teacher by trade, uh, I have a aversion to the TAS departments uh, or the technology departments taking ownership of all robotics and everything else. Robotics can fit into all curriculums and there are so many different ways that it can actually be used to enhance uh, the learning and especially get that engagement level up. 
Uh, it does fit into the tech mandatory, which is a seven to 10 uh, in the secondary environment. Tech mandatory starts in years five and six uh, within the New South Wales framework, which is pretty common across most of Australia for now, I think. Uh, most states are aligning with the um, year levels at the moment. Um, technology for learning is a uh, concept program project that has been running for quite some time in New South Wales schools. And it initially started off as just being computers in schools and allocating something. It is now turned into a massive beast, especially in the last five years that I've been involved with um, directly with the New South Wales uh, head office. And we have started pushing technology to encompass all forms of technology and especially the robotics uh, and technology integration in and across all curricular areas through K through to 12. The biggest thing that we've found to be the most important thing, especially for secondary teachers and being a secondary teacher, I knock them constantly because they're very, very slow to adopt change. Um, whereas primary school teachers, in my opinion, need to be the, the pinnacle or the, the people that we look forward to. I used to take secondary teachers down into primary schools and say, this is the way we should be learning because they are doing it the right way. They're integrating their lessons. It's not just very specific in a subject. It's the way of how do you integrate all your subjects into learning. So project-based learning becomes something that I'm very passionate about. So the professional learning has been the biggest thing that we've actually uh, found works best and has got our teachers now starting to adopt technology and robotics in their classrooms. A project that is a very large program that is supported well by the state government is a STEM.T4L, formerly known as STEM Share, that we uh, run. And to assist that project, we've got 12 digital learning officers that uh, travel across the state and do some stupid kilometers across the state. At the moment, they are locked internally, so they're doing a lot of online training. But that professional learning, and it is uh, NESA accredited, uh, is available for those schools that are borrowing these kits that are in this STEM share um, project that I'll elaborate on a little bit. Um, it's done in classes with the digital learning officers and the teachers to give confidence. The whole idea about that is to bring teachers with their class and show them how that they could in, how they could integrate technology in any of their lessons. So the DLOs go in prior to it. They work out what the lesson is that the teacher would like to deliver and then works with the teacher to be able to have a lesson which is very specific and integrating technology, which they would normally teach without. Um, we do promote it across the curriculum or it's one of my major mandates and we do have that as our, um, what we try to do with our STEM.T4L program. So I've kind of jumped into the case study a little bit here. So it's a little bit broader. Uh, the STEM.T4L program uh, allows schools to borrow and we're not renting, there's no money that's changed in hands here. Uh, they trial technology tools for everyday learning. There's six kits that are out there. There's a PC robotics kit, which currently has a Lego EV3 kits, Makey Makey and Ozobots. There's a tablet robotics kit that has Lego We Do, Dash and Dots with micro bits. Uh, there's a 3D printer kit, filming kit, VR with non-immersive and immersive, and there's a programming kit. Every single one of those has an element which is loosely based around, or actually it, it's the uh, glue that holds them all together, all delivering project-based learning. For secondary schools, um, when you're delivering this, the first area that we see that schools adopt uh, some sort of form of robotics is within the computing courses, sometimes within the TAS technology courses, and they try to integrate it to tick off some outcomes. Uh, I would love this to be something that with projects where secondary teachers have a core subject that they're teaching or a core concept, that is not necessarily based specifically within a subject, but based across subjects. And then they use some form of technology tools, be that robotics, be it any form of technology, to actually then come up with a solution to that project that's been set. Uh, the engagement levels that I find with kids when they actually get their hands on to robotics and technology uh, is second to none, to none in terms of teaching. Uh, people that may have, or teachers that may have had, um, 
engagement issues, they tend to go out the windows and the kids learning capabilities and that concrete learning is probably the biggest thing that I find uh, as a change from basically trying to do chalk and talk and flipping their heads up and hoping you can pour some information into kids' brains. They don't really work well with being talked at. They want to be engaged. Uh, Simon alluded to the fact that that engagement is huge. Kids that build, learn uh, so much better. I am a huge supporter of uh, Seymour Pabbitt. Um, if you get a chance to read his Mindstorms book, it still holds true today. Uh, there are some fantastic tools, Scratch, all of those little programming languages, still have their roots in the geometry that Seymour did with his little turtle running around drawing ge geometric shapes. You're tying in maths, you're tying so many things. Really good way to get that going. And when people start to embrace those sorts of very fundamental basics, it makes such a, bit, uh, a difference to the way kids are learning. Um, Problem solving skills are my big one. Technology and robotics is a vehicle for allowing learners to engage and develop. The, we also have a lot of research that's backed behind our STEM.T4L project. We have a, um, Dr. Rose, and I'm sorry, I can never remember her name, has written a lot of research. We needed to do this to justify its um, implementation and continued funding. And that link is there for you to be able to have a look at, uh, really worthwhile looking at. Uh, and a way for being able to implement it even in other states. Um, in secondary, robotics is one tool that we use to develop the learning and the problem solving skills. There are many and it can't be the only panacea that's available. It's, there's so many different ways to do it, but robotics is that brilliant engaging tool. Uh, there's heaps of different ways that you can get involved with it. Um, the uh, Competitions, etc. the bottom point there. Uh, the idea of RoboCup, first Lego League, first robotics, VEX is now something that's in, to, uh, in, in Australia now. And it allows the teachers, for those kids that want to take this further to get involved with it and have a very, very specific and quite complex problem to solve. So the uh, computer clubs or any kids that want to be involved with it. I found it's a way of getting those kids that not, don't necessarily pick a subject in secondary because of the elective systems that most schools run, uh, but they are still interested in those sorts of technologies and they integrate it that way. Uh, so just to sum up there, those points there's the STEM.T4L encourages the integration of technology and robotics. The DLOs for professional learning is probably the most important tool, I would say, in getting teachers to start adopting it and seeing that it is relatively easy to integrate technology and robotics in their classroom. And project-based learning being something that we very much um, encourage and are trying to develop within our schools. We've got a lot of new schools being built uh, to cater for the uh, increase. New South Wales uh, education is the largest educational uh, institution on the planet. We now exceed New York State and we are something like 10 times bigger than um, geographically than the nearest arrivals. So when we do things, we find that nobody's ever been there and it's quite difficult to, uh, to implement. Being part of that system now with ITD, Information Technology Directorate, is great being able to make a difference across the state. And a lot of the um, research and the uh, projects, et cetera, we're opening up and working with states across Australia and internationally as well, because they're very interested in the way we've done it. And we're very interested in adopting things that do work, which is, fits very, very well here. So yeah, that's me. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Greg. And uh, just uh, for, so the audience knows, we are saving up questions for at the end. So um, if, you, if you're worried you're not gonna remember the questions, maybe jot them down quickly or uh, pop them into the, the chat uh, and we'll make sure that all of the um, presenters get a chance to answer them at the end. So uh, next, I would like to introduce Gail Bray from Wyndham Tech Schools, who's gonna tell us a bit about what is happening in the VET sector. Thanks very much, Gail. Thanks, Sue, and hi, everybody, and I will share my screen. So today, um, I have my feet in two camps, so vocational education and training, uh, particularly VET and also the Wyndham Tech School. 
So what is vocational education and training? I'm just going to move my camera out. So the specific goal, I guess, is preparing students for the skills for work. So in the VEC sector, we have qualifications that commence at the Cert 1 level and go right through to the Grad Cert level. We're seeing the bulk of enrolments at the Cert 3 level, and this is due to apprenticeships. And in 2018, approximately 4.1 people undertook VEC training around Australia. And in 2019, that figure has grown to 4. 0.2 million. So we service an age range from 15 to 54 years. So providers of VET uh, training include private registered training organisations and they actually deliver the bulk of VET training in Australia. Then TAFE, which is um, who I'm representing, community education providers, enterprise, schools and universities. And the odds are a major player, of course, is industry. And this is because of apprenticeships, traineeships and work placements, particularly in the trades, health, community services, early childhood and in hospitality. So how are we using our robotics in vocational education and training? And I guess, again, I can only really speak on, on behalf of TAFE. But what we're seeing, and I've spoken to a few of my colleagues around Australia, in um, WA, they've got a couple of qualifications you can see there. Cert 2, Cert 4, and in South Australia, they have the Diploma of Applied Technologies. Queensland's currently working for CSIRO and BHP to develop a robotics course, and in New South Wales, there's programs through their skills point. In Victoria, not a lot is really happening. Um, we're seeing pockets of robotics again in engineering courses and some of our trades courses. So what do we expect our um, students to have when they come into VET? Well, it varies. For school leavers going into apprenticeships or certificate ones to three, we're looking at a year 10 or 11 completion. And for your certificate four and above, we look for a year 12 completion. And of course, we look at literacy, numeracy, communication, teamwork, um, working with technology and any industry specific competencies. And I guess that would be around casual work. And for everybody else, it's language literacy and numeracy, and the levels required will, is really dependent on the qualifications that students are going into. So what are we doing um, in vocational education and training here at Victoria University and the TAFE Farm in Melbourne? Well, the case study, I guess, that I've been involved in is the Sunshine Skills Hub. We opened earlier this year. Um, my role was to lead the implementation of an innovation space or a future skills accelerator. And at the time, we didn't quite know what that was going to look like. Um, through the establishment of an innovation or industry um, advisory group, we came up with the boot camp or project based learning um, around short courses around introducing displaced workers and upskilling and reskilling of those uh, workers around introducing them to robotics, so both social and collaborative, as well as in niche um, um, manufacturing. And also a part of uh, the other piece of work that I led in, in relation to this was the modernization of our digital qualifications to include programming, um, to include things like CAD to 3D print. And this is really because if you've been out of the secondary school sector or the school sector for, a, for a, um, quite a, um, a long time, you haven't been introduced to any of these skills. So we're seeing the role um, of VET at um, VU to actually look at how we can fill that gap. One of the major challenges we have when we look at digital technology qualifications is that government funds us 50% less than they fund our trades and health programs. So this is making it extremely difficult for us in TAFE in Victoria to be able to deliver this type of, um, of training. So I also lead the Wyndham Tech School. Um, there's 10 tech schools in Victoria and they deliver training in science tech, engineering and maths. And our role is to complement what our schools are doing and or extend what our schools are doing. And a big chunk of that work is around teacher professional learning. So our point of difference or where we add value is really in that link between the schools and industry um, around project-based learning again, where students get an opportunity to solve real world problems. And it's really about preparing them for the future of work and those careers um, that haven't even been uh, thought of yet. 
So that's it from me. Thanks, everybody. Thanks very much, Gail. And uh, we, uh, gee, we've really gone fast through all of those age groups where we are to higher education. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Damien Key, who is an educational technologies consultant, uh, to give us his view on what is happening in higher education. Thanks, Damien. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Sue. I'm just going to share my screen. All right. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. My name's Damien. Um, so I'm just going to talk you through a little bit about um, higher education and where that kind of fits in to this uh, idea of the uh, education section of our roadmap. Before I dive too much into the higher education side of things, I just want to tease out a little bit more of an idea that a couple people have alluded to. This idea with uh, the education has been part of our, our roadmap. We're a little bit different to all the other sectors that have done workshops within the roadmap. A lot of the other sectors are talking uh, very specifically about um, very specific skills that uh, are part of whatever their industry is. Whereas in education, we're kind of broken down into two different areas. We've got this idea of um, learning about robots. So the education of robots themselves, teaching people how to use robots so that they can use it in a future career. But there's also this idea of using robots to learn. So using robots as a tool that they can then use to cover other parts of, um, of learning. And especially in our primary and our secondary, we tend to see a lot more of the using robots to learn. I know Greg and Simon talked about it uh, a fair amount, that we can use robots across a multitude of different um, subjects, using robots to teach geography, using robots to teach um, science, using robots to teach maths. So that's, that's one of our major areas in the education side. And the other one there is that learning about robots, the actual um, specific content where we're teaching kids about the robots. And in our VET and our higher education, I guess we are looking more at this idea of teaching people how to use robots. We don't tend to use robots as a tool much um, at these higher levels. Now, from a very rough point of view, and I know there'll be um, little cases here and there which don't quite fit into this model, but higher education can be broken down into kind of two different areas. We've got this idea of coursework where people are studying different subjects and this idea of research. Um, in, within our coursework side of things, we can break that down into a couple of different areas. Undergraduate degrees, generally speaking, things like uh, computer science degrees or engineering degrees. Postgraduate degrees that are based on coursework, things like master's degrees and those sorts of things. The other side of our higher education um, breakdown is just uh, in the research. So within our research area, um, we see lots of things happening in things like postgraduate, postgraduate degrees again, things like PhDs but also in postdoctoral research. So research labs and other organizations embedded within higher education that are doing this kind of research. From a coursework point of view, there are many, many different ways that people can get involved in robotics and um, have a, a pathway through to um, employment after they've finished. Now, I've just got a, a couple of different ones in there. Um, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, computer systems, software, mechatronics. Even things such as mathematics, data science, information technology, we're now starting to see dedicated degrees on things like artificial intelligence. But then there's lots of other different degrees, smaller degrees as well, uh, avionics, biomedical engineering, lots of these little ones that also give people a chance to still have a play around with robotics um, as part of their degrees, but also to uh, with a view towards employment further down. So all the big ones, the, the traditional ones like electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, um, those are the ones that we still see lots of graduates coming through. But as, the, uh, as we start to see a more maturing of our robotics um, industry and employers wanting more specialized skill sets, we are seeing more of these ones, these smaller ones, such as artificial intelligence or uh, mechatronic engineering. We're starting to see them become more and more popular with our, um, our universities and our students. I'm going to do a quick case study and just in terms around coursework. So a Bachelor of Mechatronic Engineering from the University of um, New South Wales in Sydney. Typical degrees that, uh, that run these kind of um, uh, these courses are generally around about four years full time. But we see anyone, uh, we see people taking anywhere from four years up to eight or 10 years if they're doing it part time. They generally break down into, so this particular degree here, they, they um, say that it breaks into kind of a bit of mechanical engineering, a bit of control engineering, a bit of software development. 
So this is a this is an example of a university seeing the, the desire from students who don't want to do purely mechanical or purely software and coming up with these extra degrees that kind of do a little bit of everyone so that they can, you know, um, give these, these students uh, the courses that they're after. The kinds of subjects that they'll be looking at doing. So if you were to take this particular degree on, you can see in there, we've got um, lots of common stuff like physics and maths. Um, in there, they're the kind of prereqs that we, we uh, like to see from our students coming out of secondary education to have a level of mathematics or a le level of physics. But with more and more secondaries taking on things like programming, it's making it a lot easier for these degrees to, to really jump into the meat of, of what they're trying to teach. And you can see as you work through the different years there, how the, the complexity of the subjects start to build up where we start getting things like in year four, modeling and control of mechatronic systems and some, some quite advanced topics happening in there. We generally find that a lot of the degrees that if you're doing any sort of robotics, chances are you're gonna be doing some sort of thesis, uh, a fourth year thesis, which gives students a little bit more flexibility to kind of get outside of the coursework and find something there that they're interested in. If they can find themselves a, um, a supervisor that's willing to, to take on their project, then they can really jump in and start doing some, some quite interesting topics. The other flip side in terms of our higher education is our research side of things. So this is people that are doing uh, research that's not coursework. They're not following a set of instructions from a, a professor or anything like that. They're actually forging their own way and, and coming up with their own discoveries. And we tend to see these research, um, this research being done in organizations within universities. So a couple of the big ones are the Australian Centre for Robotic Vision. Um, that one's actually a collaboration between a bunch of different universities. Uh, Australian Centre for Field Robotics down at the University of Sydney, but they're also within universities. There are um, their own little uh, organisations that are devoted to doing robotics in some um, some aspect. Um, QT Centre for Robotics. There's the Monash Robotics. Um, I like things one. I like ones like uh, the Human Robotics Lab, which kind of do things just a little bit differently in terms of what we traditionally see as robotics. They're doing research into things like human robotic interaction. Um, the Creative Robotics Labs at the University of New South Wales is another great example of the application of robotics in some um, areas that we probably wouldn't have uh, initially thought of. So a little case study in terms of this uh, research side of things, the Australian Centre for Robotic Vision. Now this is uh, quite a large organisation. They've got over 150 people, uh, researchers or research students working on a variety of different um, topics. They span across four universities just within Australia, but they also collaborate with a bunch of other universities throughout the world. And their vision is to creating robots that see and understand for the sustainable well-being of people in the environments that they live. So their focus is on using visions, vision systems within robotics itself. Their research, they've broken it down quite nicely into a couple of different areas. So uh, a lot of their research could fall under any one of these five different areas. So sensing robots that can see in all conditions. So that's really looking at research at how to get robots to see properly in, um, uh, in a lot of environments that might be outside of a normal lab setting. Generally speaking, when we do robotics, things work great in the lab. We can set things up nicely. We've got nice controlled environments. But then once we get out into the real world, we start getting rain, um, shade, shadow, snow, hail. And so lots of really good research happening in how we can make the sensing of um, you know, vision systems very, very robust in situations which might not be ideal. Another one of theirs is in understanding, robots that see and understand. How do we get a robot that can measure information via a vision system? How do they actually understand what the, that information is actually giving them? Um, acting, robots that see to act and act to see. So taking a vision system and putting it onto a robotic platform and then having that robotic platform be, you know, perform useful tasks out in the real world. They've got a section uh, devoted to learning. So things like uh, deep learning you know, on vision systems and then how do we get you know, computers to actually you know, really understand what they're seeing. And the final section there is in technology. So developing the technology that vision systems will go on. How can we make these vision systems uh, more accurate, uh, faster, better resolution, those sorts of things. So lots of different areas that uh, the um, that the center works on. And like I said, over 150 people working on a variety of different topics throughout that. 
with any research um, organization, there has to be a reason for it. What's the impact? Why are they actually doing this research? And so in our case study here, the um, Australian Center for Robotic Vision, they've broken it down into three different areas, where we live, how we live, and the means to live. And then applying all their research into actual concrete um, outcomes that they can see the, the value of. So in the where we live, monitoring and protecting the natural environment, monitoring, repairing, and building critical infrastructure, and actually working with industry, working with um, other people, other players out in the market to take their research and put them into products that can benefit people in these particular ways. Uh, how we live, health assistance in the home, improved and affordable healthcare, and means to live, sustainable food production, and safe and productive resource extraction. Um, I know the, the Center for uh, Robotic Vision do a lot of stuff in terms of the agricultural sector and also the manufacturing sector. So using robotics to um, assist in agriculture. And from an Australian point of view, Australia has a very, very uh, large agricultural um, industry and that any sort of improvements we can do on that to uh, improve productivity, improve crop yields, all those sorts of things, uh, more productivity is, is a good thing. We're starting to see a lot more robotics come into things like our uh, minerals and energy sector as well. Things like BHP with their automated dump trucks and, and that kind of um, those kind of applications we're starting to see a lot more of. So kind of that brings me to the, the end of my little presentation there. But this idea that the, the research and the, the higher education side of things, we're really preparing the people that come through this, both from a VET and also a higher education point of view, we're preparing them for jobs in our industry. And I think that's where our roadmap is going to be very, very important, identifying what industry need of our higher education and of our VET sector so that we can best prepare kids for, for the industries that are out there. So thank you, Sue. No, thank you, Damien. Um, yeah, it was great to get in such a, you know, a quick fire time. We, in half an hour, we've gone from you know, kindergarten through to, to graduating. I feel like a very proud parent. Uh, so um, we are starting to get some questions coming up. Um, so Damien, do you want to start fielding those? Yeah, so one of the, the first questions we came through, let me just scroll back up here. It was a great one when we were back in our primary and secondary education. Where are we? Da, da, da. Um, yep, so I've got here a question here is how confident are your teachers in allowing the students to play? This is from One Giant Leap. And I, I'm going to kind of throw this one to, we'll do uh, Simon first and then Greg in terms of our primary and our secondary, because the, the comment was made that we, we want our teachers to have a chance to play with their robots. And, you know, how confident are our teachers in doing this? Um, <clears throat> well, sometimes you, you would probably find that a lot of teachers depends if you've some of the teachers I guess I don't want to put myself in the category yet but the older generation of teachers sometimes have more of a resistance um, mainly because uh, I guess traditional classrooms was that whole you know I guess the old chalk and talk but you know kids learning through the books and then what we find with technology it's kind of been like an equalizer so you generally find that some kids as I said some students either have the equipment or are very familiar with equipment because obviously their experiences through tablets and, and iPads, et cetera. And that then allows them, you know, all of a sudden the teacher has not so much power. So what we generally find is teacher's confidence isn't there, but I mean, part of my, with my role, I can only speak from here, but from other teachers I talk to, when we try to work with teachers, I just say, you know, allow yourself to play. I encourage our teachers to take some of the technology home, either in the holidays or on the weekend. Um, particularly if they have kids, like learn with your kids. That's probably one of the ways that I learned to do that with my own children at home. We just generally have a play. So if they do that and then to say to the teachers, you know, it's okay if you make mistakes, you, you know, the first if you can admit to the te to the students, you know, I'm learning with you. So if you, we always also make sure that the, stu the teachers have equipment with the students. So they are actually doing it at the same time. So when I work with some of my teachers here, so a quick example is, we got year threes working with um, maker bots at the moment. So my teaching with them is I'll sit in with the teachers, help them get started, kind of hang around if they need questions, but then after just like, just go and, and just play. And, you know, if you make mistakes, there's nothing wrong with putting your hand up. I mean, I do it all the time when I teach. Um, I even do it with, you know, all sorts of stuff. I'll happily admit where I'm maybe weak in something or not confident and, and learn. So the more teachers are able to do that. And even when we run workshops, for instance, through like a Robo Cup competition, we do the same thing that it's completely fine to just learn 
and if they teach themselves new skills, that's, that's the best part about it. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right there. There's a chance that we let our teachers have a play and let them make those mistakes. Greg, would you see the, the same sort of thing in a secondary point of view or is it slightly different because you've got your kind of little subject silos? Very much so in terms of the subject silos. The big thing that I find in secondary schools is that they're hell bent on teaching their subject and they've got so much content to get through in a very crowded curriculum and there's no room for technology. I, gave, uh, I often give the example because I'm really lucky because I'm not in a school, I'm right across the state and we travel when we haven't got COVID stopping us from travel, uh, right across the state on a regular basis. So we're on the road quite a lot. Uh, the big thing that I find with secondary teachers is that they do find integrating something that is going to take them time to come up to speed with uh, an onerous task for them. And they don't really want to venture down that until another teacher may have taken that time to delve into using robotics or technology in their classroom. And all of a sudden they're finding the engagement levels of the kids are up, the actual retention of the knowledge that they're applying by integrating the robotics into a traditional lesson, which you may in most cases not realize how you could actually integrate that technology. All of a sudden the kids are excelling. Uh, and it's that adoption which we find is the only way to really get it across. It doesn't happen across every school. Um, and that's the biggest problem that I see that, that we're finding. We have issues with primary schools uh, are, are fine to start integrating this stuff because call them toys, call them whatever you want. The actual ability to have something that allows them to play with and learn at the same time without you having that big learning label putting on it, uh, put on that particular learning is the biggest thing that I find is really brilliant. Taking that then through to the secondary school who doesn't do it, we find that we get a disengagement with the kids. Uh, we've got to try and keep that momentum going and it's one of the big areas that we've found. Uh, the STEM.2 for All program has allowed schools to trial what they normally wouldn't have because they can borrow those kits, they can try and integrate them into the classroom and as Simon was saying, time to play is probably the biggest thing for a teacher. Uh, we get them to the schools two weeks before the end of the term for, so that and they're borrowing it for the following term and the idea is take it home and play with it over the holidays with your kids as Simon said it's the best way I did the same thing I played with Lego for years and years with robotics until I came up to speed and then played with Ro Robo Cup a lot with Damien when he was running it to start off with having come out of university was a mad robotics scientist uh, and we all got into it and that's the sort of thing that gets you going I have a mantra that I state when I remember I'm doing presentations in schools that we have, used to have 30 learners in a classroom if you've got full size classrooms and one teacher. We now have 31 learners in every classroom. And when a teacher can adopt the idea that I don't know everything, and the kids also realize that the teacher doesn't know everything and that kids can be teachers in that role at various times, that is the best learning experience and place that you can ever have. And when you get those dynamic classrooms happening, and everything's being integrated, everybody's learning, everybody's teaching everybody else, all of a sudden that those rooms become these little dynamic learning hubs and they're brilliant. Yep, no, ex exactly right there. All right, we might jump onto a, um, another one. Um, we've got here uh, from Darren Watts. Fantastic to see a huge range of education around robotics. How does the panel see employment opportunities for these students coming through? I'm actually gonna throw this one to, to Nikki and Sue who have mm -hmm. a lot more um, interaction with the industry point of view. So Nikki or Sue, do you want to have to talk to that in terms of what are our uh, job opportunities for our students if we're giving them all this robotics education? Um, yeah, well, actually, I'd like to put that question back to Darren because I know he is in the robotics industry and I, we have a bit of a disconnect that concerns me and that I, I, I haven't quite figured out what's going on in as much as we are producing quite a lot of mechatronics uh, engineering graduates. And yet I often hear parents complain that their um, kids have done these degrees and are now struggling to find work in those fields. But on the other side, I often hear robotics companies say that they can't find qualified people. 
So I'm not sure where that disconnect comes in and whether there really is a gap between um, the degree and the occupation or not. What I do know is that at least in Brisbane, there are um, eight times as many jobs in artificial intelligence um, being advertised as there are people to fill them. And there would be no reason, you know, that a mechatronics uh, a graduate wouldn't be uh, suitably qualified for that. They wouldn't be working necessarily on robotics, but they'd be working in a very closely related field and keeping their skills up. So I really don't understand um, where that disconnect is coming in. Um, I can probably only speak from the north of the country. I don't know. What do you think from uh, down south, Nikki? Um, yes, look, I uh, being having a robotics company myself um, and dealing with hardware, I obviously do have need for people that have those skill set mechatronics um, and robotics degrees. So it's possibly um, how many companies such as mine are there around Australia and um, other manufacturing. Um, the the example up in Queensland as well, um, Sue, I think that guy, that's the AI guy that is suddenly with COVID have an absolute influx of um, needing people in the artificial intelligence space and that there just aren't enough people in Australia to fill this. That would be a prime example of what's just happened now. So I think as robotics um, is, in, is used more in Australia and that we certainly will see an increase of robotics, we will have more positions for people where we'll need the skill set. Yeah, so that, that idea that we have this disconnect, we have people from industry saying that they want um, good people and we have people coming out of university saying, I can't get a job. That's certainly something that we need to figure out what's, you know, what's happening between those ones. I think people need to realise that they may not be doing what they have learnt at university specifically. And when they get into industry, it's going to have to be something different for them in most cases. They, and you're constantly learning, even in industry nowadays. So... It might, they're a little bit narrow. You've got to broaden what you're looking at. Might be something that the graduates need to start looking at as well. And that kind of leads us into the next question. I'm going to go jump back up one here from Kieran. Millennials aren't going to TAFE University to learn all these skills. You can learn it all on YouTube. Um, you know, and he's basically saying, uh, why are we investing so heavily in TAFE and university if we can get informal learning happening so easily? So I might start, I might throw this one to Gail first, just from a, a VET point of view. And then I might have a, uh, say a few words from a higher education point of view. But um, Gail, look, what does, what does TAFE bring us that um, a YouTube course doesn't? Well, I guess it's, um, yeah, it's, it's true that 50% um, of, of learning, I think, can definitely be done um, through, through, through online. And I have staff myself that um, learn everything that, to keep up to date online. I think the practical application is what we see happening in that. So to be able to come in and, and if we're talking about robotics, potentially a robot mechanic, you could actually come in and actually pull that robot apart. Um, we're not seeing a robot mechanic course at the moment, but we could definitely uh, start to look at that more practical um, skills there. I think work placements, internships, um, the ability to connect with industry is where TAFE can definitely um, and that definitely plays a role. Um, we have uh, a lot of industry partners that were, have worked with us on the setup of the Sunshine Skills Hub, and many of them, you know, were really keen to take on work placements. As I said before, the challenge that we have is that the government funding to enable us to really um, polish these and courses and modernise these courses so industry will take on um, work mm -hmm. placement and internships is going to be a big challenge for us. But I would close by saying it's the industry connections that are definitely and that practical application that will definitely add value to the employment opportunities. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo uh, quite a few of those comments there from a, um, a university point of view. One of the things that I think university does bring is this uh, accountability. The fact that you are, you are, have signed up for a four year course and that for, for our self starters, if you're a self starter and you can learn everything that you want off YouTube, that's fantastic. That's amazing. Things like uh, the MIT um, courses and um, the uh, Peter Cork's robotics course as well, all totally free. And for those people, you could learn a huge amount out of that. I think mm. we're still in this idea that employees see the degree and when they see a degree, no matter what it is, they've got an understanding of what that student already is supposed to have. And so it, it certainly helps our employees to go, oh yeah, they've got a Bachelor of Engineering. I can assume that they've got a certain amount of knowledge. 
And so I guess that kind of then comes back to our employees a little bit as well, is can they um, start looking at other um, qualifications beyond any sort of higher education that they can look at and go, yes, you know what, um, I'm confident that you know enough to do this. I think we have to be a little bit careful too, because things like engineering degrees are backed by the um, Engineers Australia, and there are legal ramifications around having engineering degrees and those sorts of things. And so from a purely content point of view, yeah, you're right, we could learn all our content online, but there's a lot of other bits and pieces that happen through that formal education, which currently at the moment aren't picked up by informal education. And, you know, someone um, also mentioned in there that they, while they did their formal education, half of it was all through online resources. And so, you know, yes, I, I, I totally understand that. And it's a lot of money that, that you're, you're, you're paying to do these sorts of things. I'm not sure we have the right answer. Um, universities and VETs uh, play a role at the moment, but, you know, further down the track, are we going to allow things like micro-credentials and those sorts of things coming through? that um, allow people to have pathways through to employment without necessarily going through um, a formalized four-year degree. Does uh, any other panelists want to kind of weigh in on that in terms of, you know, the, the value of formal education? I probably could add, actually, Damien, um, just speaking to some industry um, partners uh, this week, it's also the non-technical skills. So you can learn the technical skills, like I say, online or, or just through playing and practicing and peer-to-peer -peer learning. But it's that teamwork and collaboration and diversity. So businesses today, um, you know, are trying to break that silo approach where the different sort of um, sec uh, sections in a, in, a, in, a, in a company, they need to start working together, particularly in software development companies. Um, so it's also about giving students an opportunity to work on this project-based learning that Greg um, actually spoke to about then having to underpin by design thinking, then having to work and problem solve in teams, um, being able to prototype and pitch to really get that confidence in presenting and communication. And those are the skills that um, industry want, because as you say, the world's moving so fast, you can pick up those te te technical skills, but how do we ensure that, that um, our graduates or even um, people returning into study have those skills that um, industry really, really are looking for? Yeah. Look, I think we've got time for one last question. Sorry, we're, we're just coming up to our four o'clock and I know we've got a hard exit there. So I've got uh, one last one here. I'm, I'm sorry to anyone that I haven't got to their question, but uh, last one here from Marie. Do you think there's confusion around the terminology? We've been mixing terminology just in the Zoom meeting alone. Robotics, technology, AI is spoken about as it would be the same thing. And, and I think we'd all agree that we have nuances in all of these, these terminologies. And yes, we're right. We've probably thrown around some of these terminology in a, a little bit, um, you know, a relaxed manner. But is this something that we need to do from a robotics roadmap point of view, Sue, where we have terminology that we are using consistently? Because I know in education, just from primary to secondary, we change um, you know, our terminology in terms of what we're trying to say. Well, yes and no. Um, I think that uh, you can unintentionally create some barriers if you, you try and define things too closely. Um, so in my mind, robotics is a subset of artificial intelligence, which is a subset of technology. And what is good for technology and encouraging uh, people to, um, I guess, feel comfortable with emerging technologies is good for AI and is good for robotics. So I don't know, I see them as so closely linked that, um, I'm not sure. Is that a is that a problem? Um, I mean, I think you just have to get a room full of roboticists together, and they could argue for hours about you know <laughs> what That's the amazing. term is. <laughs> so uh, you know, I, I'm not sure what we gain by um, getting too hung up about what the actual term is. Um, but I think it, what it really is important, though, is for people to see that those are connected and not separate things, because we have already had an experience in Australia where when people are considering how Australia can move forward in terms of artificial intelligence, sometimes robotics is not even considered in the mix. So people think that robotics are just dumb machines and that it's those clever people from our you know, computer science and data science areas who do all the magic artificial intelligence and give the robots the brains, which is completely untrue. In fact, a lot of the advances in artificial intelligence are being made by the people who are also working on the machines. And so I think 
we don't want to have these artificial separations between these um, terms, in my view. But that, that's a very personal opinion. Does it help in terms of media and our perception to the wider community to be able to define these things more specifically, though? Or does it just create a bit of confusion amongst those people that don't understand our industry when we throw around terminology too easily? Well, Damien, I mean... <laughs> In my last role, sorry, you can probably get the sense that I feel quite passionate about this. My last role was as research director for cyber physical systems. And as soon as I took that role, I was like, no one is going to have any idea what my researchers do. Yep. If they were all prepared to call themselves under the big banner of robotics, which you could argue sensing systems, computer vision, related technologies, arguably they're all applicable in robotics, people would understand them far more easily. So I don't know, I'm torn. I'm, I'm not giving you an answer, I know, Dave. No, 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 but it's good to have the discussion. Yeah. Look, I, um, unfortunately that kind of brings us to four o'clock. Um, so I'm gonna actually wrap it up now. I'd firstly like to say thanks to all our panelists today. It's been great to get everyone in, in one virtual room together to chat about these things. I think there's still lots more we need to talk about in terms of, of pushing this discussion along, but it's great to have a starting point. Anyone who's out watching this one today, either live now, or if you come, come across it at another time, we'd love to get to any sort of case studies. So if you are using robotics in an education setting, doesn't matter what setting it is, please get in contact with us and um, let us know what you're doing because we'd like to be able to show as many different people how robotics is being used in education. Predominantly, from, from my point of view, what I'd love to see is when people come and say, oh, we want to do robots. What do we do? We can then point them to a dozen different places in a dozen different areas which are using robotics and say, look, these people are all doing robotics really well. Pick and choose what works best for you and um, to, to get it up and running. So with that, Sue, is there anything else we need to do before we sign off? Sorry, no, just uh, to let everyone know that this has been recorded. So if you feel you've missed anything, then, then uh, please feel free to view the recording when it gets loaded up on YouTube. And uh, again, I invite you to complete the survey and please, yes, yeah, send in your case studies. We would love to hear some, uh, you know, good news about what, what people are doing. And um, because I'm sure since we did the last roadmap, there have been a whole range of new advances. Love to hear about them. Alrighty, thank you very much for everyone, um, from everyone and uh, we will catch up with everybody um, virtually in the future. Thanks Bye. very much.